Confusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we revive weird and wonderful science unarchived directly into your ears. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this Blast from the Past edition, baby thoughts, electronic noses, weird dentistry, memory, do-it-yourself GMO, potato bandages and duct taping warts. From the 20 kilobits per second archives, here's some timeless news from 2002 by Gina Sartore and me. Slices of human brain are being kept alive for weeks on glass chips while they're being fed mind-altering drugs. The zombie brain chips have been developed by Tensor Biosciences in California to search for better treatments for brain disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia and anxiety. Slices of living brain are needed because single cells don't show the complex interactions that tens of thousands of brain cells do when they react to psychoactive medication. Tens of biosciences say that their undead brain slices have already helped them find a potential new drug to fight anxiety, which makes you wonder just how much anxiety these slices of human brain under glass have been subjected to. In the village of Sangrampur, east of Calcutta, India, it was hit by green rain earlier this year sparking a media frenzy and worries about chemical warfare. I mean, green stuff raining from the sky would get you a little bit concerned that things just weren't natural. Analysis showed that it was perfectly natural. It was excrement from giant tropical honeybees. Now, what's more natural than giant tropical honeybees that are full of pollen from mangoes and coconuts? A similar rain in Laos in 1981 sparked fears of Soviet chemical warfare. Now we just blame it on Saddam. And a few stories here from New Scientist. Researchers have managed to grow new pig's teeth in the bellies of rats. Now, I haven't been drinking light lock. They're actually growing pig's teeth in the bellies of rats. The point of this is to be able to grow teeth from stem cells that could one day replace teeth that you might have lost. So what they've done is they've produced over 30 teeth from cells extracted from the tooth buds of six month old pigs. The cells are seeded into biodegradable scaffolds made from polymers of polyglycolic acid. The scaffolds are then transplanted into rat abdomens and allowed to develop for 30 weeks. By this time, they've formed recognisable molars. The only thing missing was the roots of the teeth, which they think they can get if they develop the teeth in your jaw bones rather than in rat stomachs. All the teeth so far have been molars, but they're hopeful that the full range of teeth could be grown. The teeth grow in the shape of the mould, so if they mould them to other shapes, they'll be able to grow other shaped teeth. Archaeologists have found evidence of a lost civilization off the coast of India. An underwater city has revealed wood carvings, pottery sculpture and human teeth. Radiocarbon dating suggests the settlement is around 9,500 years old, making this possibly the world's earliest known city. Until now, the oldest city was thought to be in the Sumer Valley in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. Daniel Fung at Kansas State University has discovered that dried plum extracts can be mixed with minced beef and pork, chicken, duck, fish, anything, and kill off foodborne bacteria such as E. coli, salmonella and listeria. So little of the extract is needed that it can't even be tasted in the meat. The bacteria are killed by safe antioxidants in the plums that can be used to preserve just about anything. Kids actually feel less pain if they're warned in advance how much something is going to hurt. Carl von Bayer at the University of Saskatchewan studied 60 children who were having their ears pierced. Half of them were warned of medium pain, and the other half weren't told anything. The 4-1 kids reported less pain regardless of whether they expected lots of pain or none at all. Honesty really seems to be the best policy with pain in kids. Cats Nine Lives is all in their purr. 
Scientists from the Fawn and Communications Research Institute in North Carolina have discovered the purring of cats is a natural healing mechanism. The sound waves created by purring are between 20 and 50 hertz, and they trigger the healing process in cats' bones. Previous research has found that exactly the same frequencies of sound strengthens human bones and helps them grow, similar to ultrasound therapy. Dr. David Purdy from Hull University explains that the human skeleton needs stimulation, or it begins to weaken, so the purring treatment could be used to stop osteoporosis and renew bone growth in the elderly. Purring appears to be the cat's way of stimulating its own bones to heal and strengthen. It's difficult for people suffering from osteoporosis to exercise, so purring therapy may be just what the doctor ordered. The New Scientist reports on an old obsession of mine, nasal research, only this time it's not a real nose, it's electronic. The Z nose, or actually as it's American, perhaps I should say the Z nose, is the first electronic nose accurate enough to be approved by the US Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, which is the National Pollution Watchdog. Its manufacturer says it can be used to sniff out pollutants in everything from plastics and perfumes to foodstuffs. To identify the chemicals in the sample, the Z-Nose uses fast chromatography, which separates them according to their chemical and physical properties. Different chemicals emerge from the chromatography unit at different times. The key to Z-Nose sensitivity is a device called a surface acoustic wave detector, which detects these chemicals and measures their concentration. It's based on a piezoelectric crystal with a complex electrode at one end that generates ultrasound waves on the crystal's surface. Another electrode at the far end detects the waves that have passed across the surface. Chemicals that emerge from the chromatography unit are momentarily absorbed on the surface of the detector crystal. This causes small but significant changes in the tone arriving at the detector electrode, which indicates the amount of chemical present. So this machine is actually using sound to tell you about smell. The information is then packaged by software into a distinctive, easily recognisable odour profile called a vapour print. So vision is coming into this as well. Ken Zeiger, who oversees production of the Z-Nose, says it has already proved its worth among Californian winemakers, sniffing out trichloroanisole, a chemical given off by mouldy corks that makes wine taste musty. TCA doesn't come up very often, but when it does, it's a big problem according to winemakers in the area. Food producers often employ sniffing panels of seven or eight people who try to detect anything amiss in their product. The Z-Nose could do this job in a far more consistent way and could also spot odours too faint for humans to detect. Besides which, a panel can tell you it's there, but it can't tell you how much is there. Do-it-yourself genetic modification is now a reality. Mary Luisa Levitrano's research team in Milan have developed a simple method of washing sperm free of seminal fluid and then simply adding the foreign DNA. The team discovered that interferon in seminal fluid prevents sperm from naturally binding to foreign DNA. Once the sperm is washed free of the interferon in a centrifuge, the sperm will take the new genes inside their cells and add them to parts of its own genome where they will function just by mixing them together. This is a huge improvement over the old technique of injecting DNA into a random place in a newly fertilised egg with a fine needle and microscope and easy enough for farmers and any first year biology students to do themselves. You can expect such a simple and precise technique to take off all over the world. A new powder made from potatoes helps blood to clot and will have uses for minor cuts to surgery and on the battlefield. The potato powder sponges up blood and stops bleeding immediately without any need to apply pressure. Then it triggers a natural clotting mechanism and dissolves itself. It acts so quickly and safely that it may spare the need for blood transfusions and unlike anything else currently available, it doesn't need any refrigeration or special preparation. It's a purely vegetable product that dissolves within a day, so there's little danger of foreign body reaction or infection. The powder is made of purified potato starch, ground into spherical particles. It's been approved by health authorities around the world and is expected to be on the market next year under the brand name of Bleedex. Gaffer tape, or duct tape as it's known in the US, is so legendary for its many uses that the Annals of Improbable Research staged an opera on the theme, and it's now being used by the US Army to remove warts. Dean Focht of the Madigan Army Medical Centre in Tacoma, Washington, discovered that if you tape over a wart with duct tape for a month, it suffocates the wart and it dies. The traditional method of freezing warts with liquid nitrogen is more expensive and is frightening for children. It also isn't guaranteed to produce lasting results, and so it often has to be repeated several times. 
The idea of using sticky stuff to suffocate warts isn't new, but it rarely works because medical adhesives can't last a whole month. You're listening to Ian Wolfe and Gina Sartore on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. This show used to be known as the Discovery Science Show until the Discovery Channel started podcasting and sent us a cease and desist order. Hi, I'm Gates McFadden, and I played Dr. Beverly Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation. And I know Dr. Crusher very well, and I am sure that when she's off duty, she would urge you to listen to Discovery, the national science program on 2SER-FM. Make it so. Here's Gina Sartori from 2002 with research into what babies are thinking. Of course, those babies would now almost be adults. We all know that babies are capable of dividing the world up into categories, much as we do. It's just that their categories are rather broad. Mum, dad, things to put in mouth, very large group that one, things to be sick all over, hopefully somewhat smaller, and so on. We use categories to understand and interpret the world and to solve problems. As we get older and more sophisticated, able to do more and needing to do more, Our categories get more sophisticated too. For example, we may want to split the general category rather attractive man over there into either rather attractive man who I work with so don't go there or rather attractive man I just want to be friends with because I'm already spoken for or rather attractive man I'm about to ask on a hot date. You can see how this kind of subtlety might come in useful. In the latest edition of the journal Cognition, Martha Atterbury and Mark Bornstein report new research into just what categories babies can use and what helps them do it. Now my first question on seeing this paper was, how on earth does anyone tell what categories a six-month-old has formed? This sort of research relies on the fact that babies prefer to look at new stimuli. Put up two pictures side by side on on video monitors, an old picture and a new picture, and babies will spend more time looking at the new one. What the baby doesn't know is that researchers record their gaze. They were deemed to be looking at a monitor when the reflection of it on their corneas was right in the centre of their pupils. Of course, the researcher making this judgement couldn't know which picture was which in case their judgments were influenced. So, for example, say two cats were presented and a baby spends equal time looking at each. This suggests the two pictures are equally interesting and probably, for the baby, belong to the same category, as it were. What if you then take one cat away and put up a dog? If the child still spends about the same time looking at each, we assume their category is the broad one of four-legged furry animals because they're not seeing the dog as new. If they look at the dog more, then they have probably formed two more specific categories. Between three and six months, children learn to categorise simple forms made out of dot patterns. For example, the orientations of lions, different types of animals, and living versus non-living things. It is, by the way, interesting to speculate on how they make this categorisation, how this knowledge is represented to themselves, considering their language skills have only developed to the level of gestures, expressions, turn-taking and babbling. But that's another story. By the second half of their first year, children can categorise both the gender and the expression of faces and can make more subtle distinctions about faces and animals. However, there's some question about whether infants use conceptual categories or simply use physical characteristics of the images. So, for example, an adult will recognise a full-colour photograph of a cat, a 3D model, an abstract line drawing and a video of a cat as all belonging to the same category because we have internalised the concept of cat. We're not sure if babies of six months can make the same leap across media. This question is also important for object recognition. Someone walking towards us presents many different views of themselves varying over time. In fact, our view of them changes from instant to instant, yet we recognise that they are the same person. All the different views belong to the category, that person coming towards me. 
What Atterbury and Bornstein found was that this is an ability that has quite a definite kick in age. Six months old and nine months old had their preferences for pictures tested in two conditions. Static pictures, then dynamic movies of light points and vice versa. The pictures were of animals and motor vehicles and the researchers first made sure that the children could actually tell them apart. Yes, all the babies could tell animals from vehicles and interestingly, animal-like movement patterns from machine-like movement patterns even though these movement patterns were just dots of light moving on a black background. So both six-month-olds and nine-month-olds can learn these categories. But only nine-month-olds could transfer from the dynamic, the moving picture, to the static. And they couldn't do it the other way around. That is, after getting used to movement patterns from two animals, replacing one video with a static picture of an animal, when it wasn't moving, produced a ho-hum, another animal, same old category response. On the other hand, taking away a moving picture of an animal and replacing it with a still picture of a vehicle got the infant's attention. It was a new category. It seems that it's easier to put things into categories based simply on how they look, the static images, than to form a concept of something where you have to ignore all the incidental details of appearance and somehow unconsciously latch onto the essence. The way an object moves, in this case biological versus mechanical movement, may be important in forming conceptual, not perceptual, categories. Of course, this won't always be the case. It's hard to see how motion could be an important attribute of categories like furniture, fruit, abstract nouns, imaginary numbers or justice, which may go some way to explaining babies' notoriously loose grip on the concept of justice and why things it's okay to throw up on is such a large category. Hello, I'm Max Planck, and I'm a famous physicist. You might know me from such famous scientific discoveries as the black body radiation formula. If there's one thing that's constant in my life, it's discovery. The National Science Show. Is that okay? Very good, thanks Max. Can I go now? Sure can. Okay. And finally, here's Gina Sartori from 2002 again, with research into forgetting and learning. What happens when we forget things? You might think that this is one of the easiest questions to answer about memory, that even if we don't know quite what memories are, we know that forgetting involves destroying or losing that mysterious stuff. Not so, according to research reported recently in Nature. Mohamed Milad and Gregory Quirk of the Ponche School of Medicine in Puerto Rico suspect that forgetting, far from being a case of destruction, actually sets up a new kind of memory that counteracts or blocks the original memory. It's as if the process of forgetting makes a kind of antimatter for memories. Firstly, let's be clear about what kind of memories are involved here. Millard and Quirk were investigating a conditioned fear response in rats and are part of the school of learning that is interested in classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is a fairly stark phenomenon, which is not quite what most of us think of when we imagine remembering something. Though its proponents would argue that all our familiar, everyday kinds of learning and memories are ultimately reducible to this simple conditioning. Classical conditioning is not too hard to explain, but you'll have to indulge me with a thought experiment. Are you sitting comfortably? Good, then we'll commence. Imagine that, as you sit, you're wearing a kind of helmet with a little nozzle on it, aimed at one of your eyes. Oh, just take off your glasses if you'd be so kind. You can also hear a pure tone, an electronic beep, playing occasionally and briefly. So, you're sitting there. Nothing much happens, except you can hear the beep. Beeps don't tend to get much of a response from you, so you don't respond. Suddenly, and this is where we find out what that nozzle was for, a gentle but fairly sharp puff of air is blown into your eye. Your natural response to something coming rapidly towards your eye, even something as harmless as a whiff of air, is to blink, so you do. This is where we get tricky. We, being the imaginary experimenters, start to play the tone starting just before and overlapping with the puff of air. If we do this often enough, eventually you'll make your reflexive blink just to the tone. It's not a conscious blink, you don't decide to do it. In fact, like all reflexes, you can't not blink. 
Hey presto, you've been classically conditioned, just like one of Professor Pavlov's dogs. The essence of this kind of conditioning is that you take a natural pre-existing reflex and graft it onto a stimulus that was once completely neutral. Blinking is a natural response to a puff of air in the eye. You don't need any kind of training to do that, but blinking to something like a sound, that takes learning. Classical conditioning theorists say that this kind of learning, making associations between simple stimuli and simple behaviours, is behind all the learning that humans and other animals are capable of. Speaking, writing, driving a car, putting on makeup successfully and telling your life story to your grandchildren, all ultimately linked to very simple learned associations. Now are you, having gone through this kind of conditioning, doomed compulsively to blink whenever you hear a certain kind of sound for the rest of your life? Well, no, I'm sure you're terribly relieved to hear that. If we keep playing the tone by itself, your response of blinking will gradually die away and eventually you'll be back where you started. This process, where a learned response disappears, is called extinction. It's as if you first learn that the tone predicts the air puff, conditioning, and you then learn that this prediction no longer holds, extinction. And uh, you can take that helmet off now, thanks. It sounds like extinction fits with our every day idea of forgetting, that some kind of learned connection is destroyed. Well, this is where Millard and Quirk come in. Although the idea that extinction is the formation of a new memory, not the erasure of an old, has been around since early last century, since Pavlov, in fact. The researchers conditioned lab rats to freeze, which is their natural fear response, to a tone which was paired with a mild electric shock. After conditioning, this response was extinguished. That is, the tone was played by itself until the rats stopped freezing when they heard it. The next day, the rats that had been extinguished, I know that sounds like they were killed, but I can't help the terminology, showed some return of their conditioned response, about 35% freezing, but not as much as a control group who hadn't been extinguished, which had 80% freezing. So, in other words, without extinction, the rats forget a bit, but with extinction, they forget almost completely. But how and where does this forgetting happen? Millard and Quirk recorded the activity of neurons in the infralimbic region of the rat's brains. This is a region, and we have it too, so you can imagine it, which is on top of the brain, on either side of and close to a line running down the middle of the brain front to back, just behind the frontal cortex. In humans, we think the frontal lobe is strongly involved in memory, planning and personality, so this is pretty close to that region. They found that when the rats were recalling extinction, that is when they were forgetting their learned response, it was these cells that were active. Now, the infralimbic region connects with the amygdala, which in rats and in people drives fear responses such as increased blood pressure and defensive behaviours like freezing. Researchers think that forgetting in this case is like an extra layer of learning. First learn that the tone is frightening, giving rise to an automatic fear response, then learn another automatic response that suppresses the first. Now, as well as providing a possible mechanism for forgetting, which is a new thing, the researchers argue that this inhibition of a learned response might explain why, after a certain point, fear in animals, including humans, seems to stabilise. Most of the time, we don't just get more and more scared. Given time, our physical symptoms like pounding veins, increased breathing and sweaty palms die away. It's the normal thing. And when this doesn't happen, we give it a name like post-traumatic stress disorder. And Millard and Quirk cite evidence that PTSD patients have less activity in the same sorts of regions as those associated with extinction of fear responses. Somehow, and of course there are bound to be other factors as well, the usual suppression of fear isn't happening so you get a panicked response. Knowing what's happening in the brain may help us to figure out more effective treatments for this sort of condition. In other words, forgetting is not just a passive loss. It may be just as active as remembering. And sometimes forgetting is a good thing. That was Gina Sartori from 2002 talking about baby thoughts and when it's good to forget. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations 
to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incombatech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station, 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.